This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius 137 across North America, and internationally at cbc.ca. I want to get, begin with a quote. The function of the artist is to disturb. In a world terrified of change, he preaches revolution. He is an agitator, a disturber of the peace, quick, impatient, positive, restless, and disquieting. He is the creative spirit of life working in the soul of men. Well, you may be surprised to hear that the person who wrote those revealing words about artists was himself a doctor, a very well-known doctor, Norman Bethune. Bethune holds a complicated place in Canadian history, in part because he lived up to his own vision of the disruptive revolutionary artist. His contribution to the medical world is considerable. He advanced treatment for tuberculosis in Canada, advocated for universal nonprofit health care, and almost single-handedly pioneered a mobile blood transfusion system during the Spanish Civil War. In 1938, he brought his medical expertise and his communist beliefs to China, then under attack from Japan. Until his death there a year later, Bethune treated countless soldiers and civilians and trained unskilled doctors and nurses in overwhelmingly brutal conditions. This last effort and the resulting honors from China's communist leader, Mao Zedong, have enshrined him as a hero in that country, but at home, his legacy has been less celebrated. Former Governor General, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, explores that legacy in her new biography of Norman Bethune. It's part of the Penguin Canada Extraordinary Canadian series. And Adrian Clarkson joins me now in Studio Q. Hello. Hi, Jan. How are you? Happy Victoria Day. And to you, too. I just thought only in Canada could you have the diverse activities that you listed at the beginning. <laughs> I wondered about, uh, from the sheepdog uh, to later, what was going to happen there. But uh, And then the tulips, I hope they did come out because we've had a very cold spring. Sheepdog herding in Victoria, <laughs> DJs in Montreal, and there's a lot in between there that we missed. I was just there. Was just, these are just random things I was picking out. You know, of all the Canadians you could have selected to write about, why did you want to write about Norman Bethune? I wanted to write about Bethune because in the 70s there was quite a vogue for him. Uh, before that, his wor- his name really in a way was anathema in Canada. B- people forget that now, and anybody under 40 certainly doesn't even know it. He was a communist uh, from 1936 on till he died in 1939. We have no idea whether he would have remained a communist. My feeling is that he would not have, that he would have moved on as he always moved on to other things. He was always in the forefront of things. But what I think is that I wanted to do him because no woman had ever written about him. And I feel that he's a very, very diverse personality. He's a very multi-layered personality. He's somebody who just doesn't fit into a category. In the 70s, um, Donald Sutherland played him splendidly in several incarnations. And everybody thinks of Norman Bethune as looking like Donald Sutherland, which in fact he really didn't. But it's Donald, not so bad. But not so yeah. bad. Yeah. Donald yeah. is wonderful and is you know a wonderful actor, etc. And he performed the material that was given to him. But we know a lot more now. Um, we have archives that are open to uh, that you can access and then ask for permission to use them, such as I uh, use the archives of Marion Dale Scott, who is arguably the woman that Bethune loved the most in right. his life. Uh, for one thing. And also, there's a lot more material that you can look at in terms of what the Chinese did about him. And I was very fortunate to be able to go to China and do research there. I went to the cave, the caves area of Yan'an, where he met Mao Zedong for the one and only time. I also felt that I wanted to, to make a more multidimensional portrait of this man who, as you so well stated, did all these things professionally and then politically. But he also, you know, he not only was he a wonderful doctor, he was a really extraordinary pioneer. He in- invented 12 instruments to deal with tuberculosis mm-hmm. and lung surgery. One of them is still uh, in use. It's called the Bethune rib shears, which are great big tree lopper looking things and are still used. And he, you know, he didn't take any money for this. He gave the money for the patents to the technician who put together these instruments. Okay, let me stop you there and try to get to as much of that as I can. But let me start with the first thing you said. So pre-1970s, you, you used the word anathema. He was written out of history in Canada. To a great extent, he was. Um, uh, there is um, a record in a letter, uh, people writing to the National Sites and Historic Monuments saying, you know, they would like some memory of Norman Bethune to be put up. 
and the return letter, which I've seen held in my hands and seen the signature of in the Osler archives in Montreal, said we do not consider Norman Bethune to be of national hin- historic importance. Right, right. I also uh, met somebody, saw somebody whom I'd known for years in Ottawa, whose godfather is one of the people mentioned in the book, a, a flatmate, an apartment mate of, of Bethune's in Montreal called Aubrey Geddes. And uh, she said that in their family, they never mentioned the name of Norman Bethune and that Aubrey Geddes never mentioned it. Ne- Aubrey Geddes' wife never mentioned it. He was as though he had been written out of polite, proper society because he was a communist. So in terms of your own personal history, how did you come to learn about Bethune? Was it Donald Sutherland? No, <laughs> no, it was not Donald Sutherland. I'm very fortunate in that I went to high school at Lisgar Collegiate, and I've dedicated the book to my high school English teacher, Walter B. Mann who taught me everything uh, uh, about literature and who was the most important person in my life besides my family. And he first spoke to me about Norman Bethune when I was about 14 and first in grade 11 in his class, in English class. And he talked to me about him, I think, because Bethune's work in China and because he was a great humanitarian, as Mr. Mann was a great humanitarian. And he said to me, you know, you should know about this man. And he told me everything that he knew. And I think I read a few things. Uh, that were not very common, but they were, you know, he found me some things, and I was very fascinated by this. And interestingly enough, my parents, who were violent anti-communists, when I told them that I was, had read this, they said, don't read anything about a communist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to them, that was absolutely anathema. Right. And uh, just really, uh, they just said, don't ever talk to us about Norman Bethune. So in a way, perhaps, I always tucked it away in the back of my mind as something which was a minor form of... Per- revolt against my parents. So given that you had that background, uh, that you, you, you learned about him at 14, and that uh, you go on to, uh, you know, you've, before this book, uh, you've demonstrated that you think he deserves an important place in our history. You did so as governor general. What did you, when you then started the research for this book, did you learn anything new? And what is, is it that you discovered that you didn't know? Oh, I discovered a whole lot of things, things I had suspected. One was that his Presbyterian background played enormous role in his humanitarianism. When people describe people today, and often, you know, in the last 20, 30 years or so, they say, you know, he was six feet two inches tall, he had red hair, he had blue eyes, he was a Presbyterian, he played football, etc. As though all of those things were equal. Mm. In fact, they're not equal. If you were born in 1890, as Bethune was... The religion son, is a big deal. Oh, religion is the big... And it was the son of a Presbyterian minister. And they moved from place to place all around the Canadian Shield area, small towns, where they were the family in town because... He, his father was the minister, so they had to set the example. He knew what it was to give a tenth of his allowance every every Sunday to the offering, so that so that uh, missionaries could be sent to China to convert people. He knew what it all was about, and I make uh, I I do paint a portrait of what Toronto and Ontario were like at that time in terms of the sea of faith being at the full, as Matthew Arna puts it in Dover Beach. And he comes out of that. His communism comes out of the humanitarianism that was bred into him through his religion. So that's one of one of the other th- one thing. The other thing was that he is frequently portrayed, and this is the other reason why I wanted to write about him, because as a woman, and you don't leave your your sex aside when right. you write right. about people. You're not right? genderless. You're not as genderless. You you're writing. not you're okay. not this sexless eye that's right. writing. You are, you know, you bring things to it. And he has been portrayed as a kind of womanizer and and careless about about feelings. And I didn't think that that was so. I thought that the bizarre uh, marriage and remarriage to the same woman twice showed that there was probably a part of him that had not grown up. Mm. He was very, very highly developed intellectually, as many, many men who are geniuses are. But that part of him didn't develop till he was over 40, and he fell in love with Marion Dale Scott, who was the wife of Frank R. Scott, one of the founders of the CCF. And uh, they fell in love, and they uh, acknowledged that love in letters, and I found that in her diaries. And this has never been used as material before. And so when I discovered that, I thought this adds a whole other dimension to him, especially as as the love was a chaste one. They decided they would not consummate it. I'm interested in your statement. You've said this a few times in in the media now in the last uh, two or three weeks, and you say it in the book, that Norman Bethune is the best-known Canadian in the world. 
How he, so? He is known by a, a billion and a half Chinese. So if you do it statistically, I think you So in a numbers game. In a numbers game. But, but he's not known in Canada. He's not known really in the Western world. I mean, you wouldn't walk down the streets of Los Angeles or London, England and say Norman Bethune and expect people to know who he is. Right? No, I'm playing it as the numbers game just because what other Canadian is known by a billion and a half people? So despite being the best known Canadian in the world in that sense... He was for a very long time unrecognized, almost neglected in Canada. You attribute most of that neglect to his communist beliefs, saying, and I'm quoting you, it was almost as though he was being blamed for having been raised to heroic stature by the Chinese. What do you think that reaction said about Canada? I think it showed an, a kind of ignorance and a, a sullen una, unawareness of what the rest of the world thinks thinks about things. I think in... in uh, politically sophisticated circles of people who look at what is going on around the world, even in the in the, the Red Scare 40s and 50s. Uh, Norman Bethune was recognized to be a highly interesting character, particularly because why why does somebody become this this person? This man died in order to have a to li to live. You know, why couldn't he have just died in China and not be remembered? Or, mm. All right, there's the essay by Mao Zedong, the only essay Mao Zedong ever wrote about a foreigner. So that keeps him alive. The fact that little school children for 40 years, 50 years, were made to memorize that, that Norman Bethune was the symbol of internationalism, was the symbol of the outside world to the Chinese that would come to their aid. Now, it was conveniently ignored at, at the time that he went to help the Chinese. He wasn't just helping the communists. He was helping the Chinese. They were a united front of the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong's communists, to repel the Japanese, whom Bethune considered to be the fascists in this case. But this uh, trepidation around making Bethune into a hero, it isn't just something of the past. It continues, right? And and uh, especially around his, I mean, what do you say to people who say, well, why should we, why should we canonize, why should we uh, laud someone who was involved with and beloved by uh, the Chinese communists? You wrote an, an op-ed in the Globe and Mail in April arguing that it's time for Toronto, especially where he has a, a lot of roots and not far from Gravenhurst where, where Bethune was born, to step up in recognizing Norman Bethune. One, leader, uh, one reader uh, responded uh, in the letters and, and said, uh, and noted that the opposition to Bethune is based on his communist beliefs. This is the, I'm quoting the letter, uh, in effect, Bethune provided Mao with a powerful propaganda tool. What do you say to someone like that? Well, I just think that that's uh, a little bit outdated and it makes me feel that uh, it's not exactly uh, taking into account the fact that People need symbols for whatever political beliefs they have. And in this particular case, it was because Bethune died, really as a martyr, operating uh, with the Eighth Root Army. When they had run out of rubber gloves, they had run out of, of antiseptic, they'd run out of everything. And he died because he kept working. And he worked for 18, 20 months without leave, mm -hmm. without anybody around him that he could speak to uh, personally except one interpreter. And I think it's very out of date to say, you know, he was a communist, therefore let's bang him over the head. I think that that um, that he he symbolized something, and he symbolizes still beyond what he symbolized to the communists. He symbolizes something to us as Canadians. All his life he cared for other human beings. All his life he made sacrifices for other human beings. The fact that he became a communist and did it that way in the last three years of his life, that's you know, that's just part of his history. Well, and what you said is just interesting there because uh, uh, not if, if the issue is that he was a communist, uh, he wasn't even a communist for most of his life. It, uh, you know, that, this is the somewhat shocking in your book when you realize, okay, he starts to join the Communist Party in 1935. Be that a good or bad thing, uh, he's already lived 45 years of his life. He's about to die three years later. So he hasn't been a communist his entire life. And uh, presumably we should be remembering him for more than just the final three years of his life. And he says in one of his letters in, in 1935, before he became a communist in Montreal, he became a communist in Montreal as a result of the horrible depression and the hideous poverty that he saw in Montreal was the poorest city in Canada. People died like flies of tuberculosis and he was very upset about that and he felt the socialists, the CCF, were not able to handle it because he felt they were sort of namby-pamby and too soft and he gradually came to the idea that you must have something radical and sharp in order to make that change 
And when he saw that that wasn't really going to happen, um, he, he tried the soft political route by putting together a group to uh, promote a, a kind of uh, sponsor, really, a kind of pilot project in public health and public medicine. And it was totally ignored uh, in the election of 1936, in which Maurice Duplessis challenged the current premier, who happened to be Adlar Godbout. They didn't even pay any attention to it, even though a number of people had worked on this. And it's, if you read it today, it's the kind of thing that we brought into this country in, uh, on a national scale just 30 years ago. But it, it, it's on a macro level, if we zoom out for a second, it suggests that also that, uh, I'm just thinking of this, this question of, of Bethune being a communist and that affecting whether we should have statues of him up. You know, uh, it, it suggests that, uh, that who and what we consider heroes is subjective. In other words, that there isn't a basis of what, based on accomplishment, but it's affected by ideolo ideological values or personal character or revelations about what might, might have happened in their personal life. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's affected by the fact that, you know, nowadays we have things like Doctors Without Borders. We have all these things that are the spiritual children of the kind of thing that Norman Bethune did. Mm. We have young people wanting to go to places in order to help. We have all of that, that, all of that is really part of Norman Bethune's legacy and spirit. And that's why we should honor him, because this man, there was, once he thought he could help something, he went right away. People think that he went as the doctor of the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. He did not. He was in and out of Spain before they even got organized enough to go to, go to Spain. He didn't attach himself to that. He went singly as a doctor just to say, I am a doctor. I will help the Republican cause. But you mentioned, I mean, <laughs> just not to be this over the head, but you mentioned Gretzky at one point in the book. <laughs> and I mean, you know, Gretzky, we, we th I would assume part of why we think he's a hero is he's a great hockey player, incredible hockey player, magical hockey player. If we find out tomorrow that he was a communist or is a communist, does that change how good a hockey player Of course player not. Is? Of course right. not. Just as it doesn't, you, sh you can't change history. Just as it seems to me that when, when somebody falls from grace as a, as a, uh, as a public person in, in some way, uh, you shouldn't deny that they were once graceful. You know, you couldn't possibly. Right. And, um, and I think that with Norman Bethune, you have to say that he chose communism because it was a way that he thought could help to change the world when he saw the other ones weren't working. And he writes about that. In fact, there's so much documentation in terms of the letters he wrote to friends, the, the kind of study groups he was involved with in Montreal, which tells us what thought he went what thought went around him. However, I also want to point out mm. there is no evidence that he ever said there is no God um, and religion is the opiate of the people or anything like that. In fact, there is evidence to the contrary because he tells people in letters that on Sundays he's been going to the Lutheran Church right. in Madrid under bombardment. And I don't think he, he ever, I think there are many complications and complications in people's lives and it doesn't mean that you did one thing that, that means you gave up the other. You observe that even Bethune's contemporaries, and I'm talking medical contemporaries now, in transfusion, overlook his immense c contribution to the field. And you wonder if, and I'm quoting, perhaps it was Bethune's personality, personality which made many people want to write him out, uh, him out. He was abrasive, impatient, and domineering. How much do you think his personality affected the way he's remembered? Well, I think uh, uh, in a public way, uh, he could behave like that because he was impatient. He wanted to get things done. In a private way, he had wonderful friends and a great circle of friends who loved him. And the woman he loved, um, at, the end of, uh, at the end of their relationship when he went off to Spain, she, she writes in her diary, I wish I could have told him that he was one of the two nicest people I've ever known. And you see, a woman who's loved somebody like that would not say the two <laughs> nicest people. She could say all sorts of things about him. You know, the sexiest, the uh, funniest, the brainiest. But then why? Why would he have this reputation then? Because he, he, unfortunately, he was impatient. And you see, he didn't have that reputation in China. The Chinese loved him because they took what Canadians t take for impatience, they took as eagerness. What hmm. Canadians take for arrogance, they took for determination. There are cultural differences here. He found his spiritual home in China. The Chinese adored him for that. They loved everything about him. He was dominant, all of those things the Chinese enjoyed and liked. Canadians don't go for that. When you talk about his internationalism, uh, 
and then you you talk about opening the doors to things like Doctors with Borders, uh, his progressive approach, his impatience. Do you ever get the sense that the world, and especially Canada, just wasn't ready for Bethune? Well, you know, the world is never ready for somebody who comes uh, and and brings in himself as a message. He himself was the message, uh, something that that they're not really kind of ready for, because of course he's ahead of the wave the whole time. He's he, he didn't he's not a surfer, you know. He just didn't capture the perfect wave, etc. He's ahead of the wave. I'm writing all that the time. down. He was not a surfer. <laughs> Right. Bethune, not a surfer, okay? <laughs> Remember that, GM. Yes. Remember that. Yeah. And he was somebody who knew uh, where he was going to go. That's that's why I quote the Gretzky. You know, go to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. <laughs> and that's what, he, that's what he was all the time. I mean, why go to China? Why go to China in 1938? Because the Japanese had invaded it. And he decided they need doctors. I've heard they need doctors. After you've go. just come back from Spain, yes, <laughs> and created a, a new form of uh, blood transfusion, uh, mobile blood, blood transfusion. You state that Bethune, in his internationalism, was part of sh- the shedding of the cloak of colonialism in Canada. I'm quoting you there. How important was he? Is he to our changing perception of what it means to be Canadian? I think very, very important because he shows, for one thing, he didn't choose to do anything with. Uh, the kind of countries that we have been colonies of, you know, Fran- France, England, etc. In fact, he c- was very uh, annoyed at the at the British in Spain because he felt they wanted the fascists to win. So that's why he kept his relationship to the British embassy um, and the British people uh, who were on the ground there to an absolute minimum because he really believed they wanted Franco uh, to win and they did not want Spain to continue as a republic. Uh, I think that he basically became the kind of person he did because he couldn't become anything else. There are people like that who emerge in history, and they intervene with with historical events, usually just once, in his case twice, which was the Spanish Civil War and the Chinese struggle. Uh, and they become uh, they become part of that struggle while not affecting it. He didn't keep Franco from triumphing. Right. He he didn't help Mao to win the Chinese Revolution. He saved maybe thousands of lives on the ground, but ten years before Mao was really won as a revolutionary. So he just inter- his life intervened with that, and that makes his life significant. It doesn't necessarily mean that he helped. Uh, them win those victories. Thanks for coming in today. Enjoyed it very much, Jan. Happy Victoria Day. And to you, too. The Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson is the author of the Norman Bethune biography, which is part of the Penguin Canada Extraordinary Canadian series. She was with me here in our studio in Toronto.